Welcome, thank you for coming to the ACLU of Vermont's 51st annual membership meeting. Uh, yeah. uh, my name is James Duff Lyle, I'm the executive director of the ACLU of Vermont. Uh, and I just I want to thank everybody for coming and spending the afternoon with us. It is wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues uh, here among us. Um, I'm going to just really quickly jump into reviewing the agenda, go over a couple of housekeeping items really quickly, uh, and then I'm going to step aside uh, for the main event. Um, in a moment, I will be introducing our presenters, Nico Amador and Ashley Sawyer. Uh, who will be leading things off with a presentation on the ACLU Vermont's statewide advocacy campaign, Smart Justice Vermont. Um, that is uh, a campaign to reduce Vermont's prison population by half and eliminate racial disparities uh, that are among the worst in the nation. Uh, following that presentation, we will have time for Q&A, uh, followed by a quick, uh, maybe 15 minute break. Um, after the break, ACLU Vermont President Julie Kalish will deliver a report. Uh, I will also uh, have a short report um, talking about some of the incredible work that has happened over the past year and looking ahead uh, to the work uh, that, that remains in 2019 and beyond. Uh, following those reports, we will move to the awards presentation. And this year we are really thrilled and honored to be presenting uh, the ACLU Vermont's David W. Curtis Civil Liberties Award uh, to the student organizers from across the state who worked to raise the Black Lives Matter flag at their schools this year. Um, so several of them are gonna be here with us today uh, representing uh, their student groups. Some of them are gonna be coming in uh, over the course of the day and probably around uh, the time that we take a break. Um, but we're so happy to have them here with us and to be able to recognize them and their achievement, uh, their courage and their vision for uh, a better Vermont. Uh, so after that awards presentation, we will announce the board election results, introduce you to our newest board members, and we will adjourn. So, um, housekeeping, oh, let's see. So uh, before we begin, I'd also like to invite uh, our current board members uh, to identify themselves, stand or raise your hand. Um, I would like everybody to uh, have the opportunity to recognize you and thank you for your service to the ACLU of Vermont. So can board members stand or, or raise their hands, please? ACLU Vermont staff members who are here to please stand or raise your hand. Okay. Um, so th these are all the people who planned and organized this event and are also responsible for all of the incredible work uh, the ACLU Vermont has done over the past year, all of the victories and accomplishments. Um, so, you know, if you get a chance to introduce yourself to, to staff and board members while you're here, please do so um, and, and thank them for their work. Um, finally, uh, I also just want to say a special thank you to all of the ACA Vermont members and supporters who are here. Uh, we could not do our work without you, so thank you again for your support. Uh, so, just very quickly on housekeeping, I will draw your attention to the registration table. If you haven't already signed in with Andrea or uh, received your name tag, you can do it there. Uh, if you need a parking pass for um, lot parking, you can get one there. Uh, you can also vote in this year's board election if you have not remember and have not done that yet. Um, I would also uh, direct you to our fundraising team. We're standing in the back of the room, Barbara and Stephanie. There they are. They would love to help you make a gift today. Uh, every ACLU donor who, get, uh, who uh, donates today gets a blue ribbon. Uh, for any donation over $100, you can choose a thank you gift uh, of either an ACLU Vermont coffee mug or tote bag. Uh, available while supplies last. Uh, so, uh, so please, so, there they are. Um, so please uh, go and say hello to um, 
to Barbara and Steph when you get a chance. Uh, I will also draw your attention to uh, the merchandise table where Kate uh, is standing back there. Um, and there you can find a range of high quality uh, apparel blazoned uh, <laughs> with our new and improved logo. Uh, perfect, ideal gifts for friends, enemies, and loved ones alike. Um, so, uh, tea, coffee, water, and snacks are available at the back. Uh, restrooms are located through those doors. Uh, and any other logistical questions, please direct to any of the staff, Andy or myself, or anybody here. Um, okay, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, our presenters. Uh, Ashley Sawyer is a criminal justice reform advocate who has been working with the ACLU Smart Justice Campaign as a consultant, organizer, and public speaker since January of 2018. Before joining the ACLU Smart Justice Campaign, Ashley worked with Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform, in their efforts to fight for needed changes to Vermont's criminal justice system. She also sits on a legislative advisory panel focused on using restorative justice to address domestic and sexual violence. Ashley came to this work having been directly impacted by the criminal justice system and as someone whose life and family have been impacted by the collateral consequences of that experience. Um, so please welcome Ashley. Nico Amador joined the ACLU Vermont as community organizer just over a year ago, uh, with more than 10 years experience as a community organizer, organizing trainer, and educator. His prior work includes grassroots efforts to close prisons, fight discrimination, win a living wage, support urban farming, defend the rights of conscientious, conscientious objectors, and build leadership for trans justice. Nico was previously director of Training for Change, where he worked with a wide range of community-based organizations and trained thousands of activists from around the world on skills for making social change. Please welcome Nico. So just really quickly, um, Nico and Ashley are going to be presenting on the ACLU Vermont Smart Justice Vermont campaign. Uh, this is part of the national ACLU's multi-year, multidisciplinary, uh, strategic advocacy campaign to cut the U.S. prison population in half and end the racial disparities that have come to define our criminal justice system. As part of that effort, we launched Smart Justice Vermont in January of this year uh, with the same goal, to cut Vermont's prison population in half and eliminate racial disparities in our criminal justice system. So we are just eight months into this effort, and we are already starting to see the fruits uh, of the incredible efforts of Nico and Ashley, their colleagues at the ACLU, our grassroots allies, our partners in the legislature, and community members statewide. Uh, there is no doubt that we still have a long way to go. Um, we often note that it took us decades to get into this mess, the mess of mass incarceration. It is not something that we're going to reverse overnight. Um, but the energy around this campaign is really palpable and really exciting. Um, it seems every week brings a new uh, uh, development. Um, and so, I mean, I think the momentum that we have generated in a really short, short time is really remarkable and it is n in no small part due to the efforts of Nico and Ashley. So um, while the road is long, we are definitely uh, uh, on, on the right uh, path. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nico and Ashley uh, to share more about Smart Justice and why it matters. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, it's great to be here and it's been such a pleasure to work with Ashley uh, on this campaign for the last uh, six months or so, um, and uh, today we want to just give you a taste of some of the things that we've been talking about and working on as part of the Smart Justice Campaign. Um, but before we jump into kind of the big heavy topic of mass incarceration, let me just start by asking how many people in this room uh, have done something in their life that could be considered a crime? And I'm not talking about like a parking ticket, but like, you know, you took drugs at some point, or you trespassed, or maybe you got a fight, <laughs> something, okay, yeah. So, so I saw a bunch of hands up, um, 
and and I, I think that's that's important to just look around and, and notice uh, right in this moment. You know, um, I don't think anyone would have walked into this room and said, you know, yeah, this this ACLU gathering room full of criminals. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I, I think that's that's part of the problem that we're addressing is that it's very easy to uh, build a, a definition or an image of who a criminal is and, um, and to think of it as these bad people over here, not us, right? Um, when we know a, a lot of what leads people to become entangled in the criminal justice system um, isn't just that they've done some harm, but it's also influenced by, uh, by poverty, by how heavily uh, policed uh, a particular community is by structural racism, um, even by disabilities and things like that. Um, so that's that's part of the goal of this smart justice campaign, uh, and we'll talk about a lot more. But but just to kind of humanize and, and bring in the stories of uh, how people end up in the criminal justice system, and then how difficult it can be to get out of that once you're actually entangled. Um, so we wanted to start just by showing a couple very short films that highlight some, uh, some personal stories uh, that are, uh, I think, representative of some of the issues that we've been working on. Uh, so we'll do that, and then we'll come back to talking uh, a little bit more about Vermont and criminal justice reform here. Life without parole. 20, 20, 40, 40. It was like a punch every time he said a number to me. The judge assessed my bail at $250,000, and my entire life was determined right there within 30 seconds. I told my daughter's mother, I said, I'll be back. And of course, 13 years later, I had still to come back. I was a kid. I mean, I had just barely turned 21. I lost my business, my housing. I couldn't see my kids. My own daughter, I came home and she was referring to someone else as her dad. I wasn't a bad kid. I was just a kid who made bad decisions. So in the 1970s, there was only about 350,000 people in our prison system. And today there's over two million. And a lot of that growth has to do with uh, the war on drugs, um, the, the pressure for people in office to pass harsher and harsher sentencing laws. I think uh, the culture and a belief that the way to solve crime uh, is to be tough, you know, to put people away for a long time, and, and to really build policy off of the worst, most sensational stories rather than really thinking about what is it that causes uh, the most common forms of crime and, and how do we actually resolve that, that behavior in a way that's effective? How do we address our social problems, not through punishment, but through other kinds of, of programs and resources and services that are needed to address uh, or, and get at the root causes of, of why people may commit various kinds of harm or get caught up in uh, the criminal justice system. So that's, that's a question that we want to be asking through the Smart Justice, the Smart justice campaign. And, um, you know, and, and I, I, I think it's very easy in a place like Vermont to think of these national problems when we hear mass incarceration, when we hear structural racism, to feel like that's something that's happening somewhere else. And I think uh, part of what we're learning is there are a lot of those national problems, a lot of those stories that were highlighted in these videos that also happen here in Vermont. So I'm gonna hand it off to Ashley, who's gonna talk a little bit more about that. And, um, and then we'll, we'll share a little bit more about uh, what we've been doing in the past year. Boy, this part is not very long. <laughs> Um, so as you saw in those videos, you know, for example, uh, the first one we watched, which was Lebanon's Choice, um, it talks about, you know, that there are 80% of women incarcerated, for example, are moms. Well, I was one of those. So here in Vermont, uh, we, it's basically even higher of a number, it's about 87% of all women incarcerated in the state of Vermont are mothers, as I was. 
So I received a 14 month to four year sentence. Uh, the crimes I committed were false pretense, my felonies were a false pretense, and an uttering of forged instrument. So in layman's terms, I cashed two checks that weren't mine. Um, so I got up to four years to serve for that, never having stepped foot in prison. And they knew that my crimes were based out of addiction. So I'm also a former heroin addict. So that is one of those things where uh, mass incarceration is fueled, especially in Vermont. And it's really easy to watch these videos and think, that doesn't happen here, or we're mostly a white state, we don't have those problems, or you know, a lot of people watch in the media um, a lot of the drug busts that are happening lately and talking a lot about out-of-state prisons and how you know, we only send really violent people there. That's not the case. So anybody in Vermont who's sentenced to six months or up can be shipped out of state. It's not just the violent people, it's people who have first-time offenses, who are non-violent. Um, and it's not just people of color coming from out of state. Most of the drugs sold in the state are sold by white Vermonters. I was one of them. Um, so that's the reality is, is looking at our prison growth, our prison <coughs> growth follows the national trend. You know, it's triple what it was just a couple decades ago because of these sort of tough on crime, you know, ideals, uh, the war on drugs, which the war on drugs was really just a war on poor, uh, disabled, uneducated, I mean, there's just a whole list. It wasn't actually a war on drugs. It was just another form of systemic racism. And now what they've done is they've turned that into segregation and now they segregate anybody they don't wanna deal with. So if you have an addiction, if you have mental health stuff, if you have disabilities, if you're poor, this is the end result. So, you know, really looking at racism, it's really easy to look around and think that Vermont is mostly white, that this doesn't happen here, that we don't have a racial disparity, and the reality is, is we have the worst racial disparity in the nation. Um, as you can see, there's these statistics um, came out of studies done um, by Stephanie Seguino. Um, talking about the, the reality here is that one in every 14 black men in Vermont is incarcerated. And that's much higher than anywhere else based on population. Uh, black drivers are two to three times more likely to be stopped by police, but less likely to be found with contraband or in any commission of a crime at all. And lastly, you know, really talking about, this starts even younger. So black students and Native American students are more likely to be suspended from school, middle school, high school, and therefore, exponentially more likely to have involvement with the criminal justice system further down the line. So these issues are very Vermont specific. I've suffered many of them. We talked, looked at, you know, um, Johnny's home. And he talked about, you know, the going on 50 or 60 job interviews. Well, I am flagged as a high risk employee. It doesn't matter how long I've been clean and sober. It doesn't matter how much education I have, how long I've been free of supervision. I will always be a felon, I will always be a high-risk employee, and that will follow me forever. I can't be a chaperone at my daughter's school. I, I work for the ACLU, and I cannot go to the Shelburne Museum with my daughter because I'm a felon. So the, the consequences aren't only for me, they're for my children as well. And people who have different charges than mine are blocked from education, they're blocked from public housing, there's thousands of things that having any sort of criminal background <coughs> bars you from for life. So why did we need smart justice? And Nico's gonna tell you about what it's looked like here in Vermont for us this year. So uh, smart justice is a national campaign of the ACLU that has put forward the bold goal of trying to reduce the number of people in prison in the US by 50%. And we did feel like, because of all the things Ashley just said, we need that campaign here in Vermont as well. And we want to take that goal and translate it and, and figure out what would be the blueprint for uh, reducing the number of people in prison here in Vermont by at least 50%, while also addressing some of the problems with structural, structural racism and racial disparities in the criminal justice system. 
So we launched a campaign in January, and uh, we have been doing a, a ton of public education work. Uh, we've been meeting with legislators. Uh, we've been looking at legal angles and some of the things that our attorneys can do to litigate in ways that would support the goal. And so some of these pictures are, are just a few uh, highlights from the past year. Our launch in January, some of the uh, press interviews that we've done. Uh, we did an art show uh, with Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform, uh, showing some of the artwork by people in prison uh, in Vermont to, um, to, again, kind of humanize and bring light to some of those personal stories. And this is me also mailing a candidate survey that we sent to people running for state's attorneys. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so I'm gonna click to the next slide. Uh, so we did a, a poll uh, earlier this year to find out, so what do Vermonters think uh, about our criminal justice system and about some of the goals that we're putting forward? And one of the things that we learned from doing this poll is that 68% of Vermonters say it is important to reduce the number of people in prison in Vermont. So we think we are launching this campaign at a moment where there is receptiveness to it, and, and I think people are starting to understand that incarceration is not the way to make our community safer, um, but just a thing that uh, continues to uh, kind of grow exponentially when it's, it's not kept in check, that um, you know, there's a lot of private interests involved in um, profiting off of prisons, and so it's time to start looking at uh, other alternatives um, so that we don't just continue pouring more and more money into corrections without really <coughs> thinking about what, uh, what kind of impact that's having on our communities. So we, this year, uh, we were, t you know, we, we did our launch and we knew as we started out that uh, this isn't going to be a thing that we can do overnight. That cutting the number of people in Vermont's prisons by 50% uh, is going to be a multi-year, multi-disciplinary campaign in lots of ways. There's so many different things that we have to look at in order to get to that goal. And so I think our focus this year was trying to figure out uh, what's something we have uh, an opportunity to um, take the lead on in this first year. And uh, one of the opportunities in front of us was the fact that all the people who are uh, state's attorneys and state's attorneys in Vermont uh, were up for re-election. So we decided this year we we're going to focus the goals of the Smart Justice Campaign uh, on prosecutors and, uh, and helping people become more aware about the particular role that prosecutors play in our criminal justice system. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit more about our work on that, but, uh, but we wanted to just uh, show one more quick video um, to, to just kind of illustrate, like, this is why we think uh, this particular aspect of the campaign is important for us. So people don't like to talk to me at dinner parties because I'm not going to talk to you about the death penalty or the war on drugs. I'm going to talk to you about things like prosecutors. 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 Uh, I am here to uh, offer my semi-informed opinions about the power uh, and potential hope in district attorneys and prosecutors to defuck the criminal justice system. There's an acknowledgement now, because I'm a public defender, I'm on the front lines, um, that there's something deeply wrong with the way that our system operates. Other than the general understanding of how the system works, people have a limited understanding of who the players are and what their actual roles are in the, in the system. It's puzzling to me that, that prosecutors have gotten so little attention when they, when they do so much. And I think it's because they sort of operate in sort of this in almost invisible middle space. But the middle is the most critical part, is the middle, what happens in court, driven by prosecutors and laws that give them a ton of power, both reinforces what happens at the beginning and drives what happens at the end. The prosecutor actually is a huge part of how safety is shaped in a city, what is prosecuted and what's not, what are the recommended sentences for people, what does bail look like. The prosecutor is actually the they are the leverage point there. They operate with almost unfettered discretion um, and have been using that discretion to, to drive over, intentionally or not, to drive over prison populations over the past 25, 30 years. The reality is that our justice system is overloaded. We charge 
people with crimes at a rate that is exponentially higher than we could ever take those cases to trial. The system, as it's designed, encourages prosecutors to seek these wins that are easily countable. You know, conviction rate, conviction rate, conviction rate. But when you're just chasing numbers, you leave a lot of the humanity out of it. Without thinking about the real harms that that, we call it assembly line justice, uh, may have on the individual being prosecuted. I wish that prosecutors could get to know the people that I represent. I try to introduce them to a person who's not just a criminal, who isn't just the product of all the worst things he or she has ever been accused of doing. It takes some vision, it takes some bravery to be a prosecutor who says, this isn't right. This isn't, how the, this isn't how I want an office to function, and this isn't the role I want my office to be playing um, in the deterioration of communities. And one of the things that has been powerful over the past couple of years is that people, uh, advocates, have been informing uh, citizens about the immense power that the, the district attorneys have across the country to actually change the way criminal justice looks. Prosecutors tomorrow could change the justice if, if they wanted to. The prosecutor or DA has total control over reform. In fact, we can't have real reform without them. In 2018, over a thousand of those elected prosecutors are up for election. Each of those represents a chance for that particular community to make a statement. What the public wants to have happen is what the district attorney should be doing. Local DAs respond to the local electorate. They are the only people who have any control over them. And so the way to control who's at the top is to vote. I care about voting in a democracy. I know, it's old fashioned. An elected district attorney has the power to set policy for an office of hundreds of lawyers, which in turn has a ripple effect to thousands and thousands of cases every month in the system. One of the things that I'm always mindful of is that people made this system, so people can remake the system, people can transform the system, people can undo the damage and build new imaginative beautiful things that actually do work for people. And I think that that's the moment that we're in now. So yeah, it's super, uh, it's like a big deal. So, so this year, um, we did a bunch of things uh, around the current state's attorney election, and still are, um, but uh, we, we thought that this was an opportunity, you know, we don't have a, a, a ton of, of really, you know, kind of like standout prosecutors running that are like the reform champions, um, but we did see it as an opportunity to at least get Vermont Montrose learning and talking uh, about the role of this office. I know I didn't know very much about what state's attorneys did when I started working on this campaign. Uh, and so, so it's been an education for me as well. Um, we hosted and live streamed uh, a candidate forum uh, and invited uh, all state's attorneys who are run it, running in contested counties this year to attend. Um, and uh, we know there is uh, thousands of people that, that watch that online. Um, so we felt like that, that was a big success for us. Um, we surveyed all the candidates who are running for state attorney on uh, 20 pretty rigorous questions uh, about their reform positions, which we think, you know, if nothing else, uh, helps to put uh, current state attorneys on, on notice to say, these are gonna be questions that you're gonna be held accountable on going into the future. So whether you're telling us the truth about what you think right now, or whether you're just saying something that sounds good, uh, we are gonna be building a base of voters who are gonna keep asking and keep paying attention to what decisions you're actually making in that office. Um, uh, thanks to the help of our communications director and, and other folks, uh, we've done widespread communications via social media, posting videos like the one that you saw, um, doing other things to just uh, highlight the importance of this particular role. And, and we also made a lot of direct contact with ACLU members. So I know I had volunteers coming uh, into the office before the primaries. Uh, we made over, I think, three or 400 phone calls uh, to ACLU members who uh, are living in contested counties uh, for the state's attorney race and, uh, and also got out and did a lot of outreach, uh, a lot of these kinds of public presentations. Um, and, and also did some tabling and, and other ways just to connect with people um, to start this conversation. So, um, so we feel really good about this being a, a first step 
And going forward, we're going to continue to make this an issue. Um, one of the ripple effects that, that we saw from this work on the state's attorney is um, even though we weren't necessarily targeting the, the governor's race and we're really more focused on this, um, a lot of the talking points started to get picked up by, uh, by people who are running for governor. Uh, the, um, the Democrats here in Vermont uh, uh, revised or changed their platform a little bit to include a goal around reducing incarceration. Mm -hmm. So we feel like within a few months' time, uh, this message is starting to get across, and, and we do see people uh, in public office uh, paying attention and, um, and starting to really think about uh, how we can translate uh, some, of these, uh, some of these ideas into policy. I see your hand, and we're going to take questions uh, in just a few minutes, uh, but I want to keep us moving, uh, but I promise we'll come back to it. Yeah. So. Next slide. Yeah. So uh, we also just wanted to say a little bit about uh, what's next for our campaign. Like I said, uh, we're still in our first year, and so there's a, a lot more work to be done. Um, and I think a lot of momentum to build uh, off of, not just uh, in the state's turning election, but also with the ways that Vermonters are paying attention to some of these big headlines. Um, just in the past uh, couple weeks, we learned that uh, Vermont is currently sending uh, the couple hundred people who are uh, in prison out of state um, from Pennsylvania, where they have been, uh, to a private prison facility in Mississippi. And we know that that's something that a lot of people have reacted to with a lot of concern, with a lot of anger. And so, uh, so it's things like that that we want to be um, building off of and, and inviting people who are upset about those kinds of issues uh, to, to be a bigger part of our campaign. So, um, so one step we want to take uh, over the next uh, year or so is to start developing a blueprint um, to say, here's how we get to that 50% uh, reduction, here's how we um, start addressing problems like the fact that we are having to send uh, people out of state to, uh, to facilities that you know, we think uh, may expose people to any number of human rights violations. Uh, we want to figure out a plan uh, to propose to say this is how we actually do bring those people back in state, um, not by building giant new prison complexes, but by reducing the number of people in our prison system so we don't have that kind of overcrowding problem. Um, we also want to be working for legislative re reforms on drug policy, on sentencing, on bail reform, and on data collection, which sounds really wonky and boring, but that is actually a really key piece that we're missing right now. We don't have enough information from departments of corrections, from prosecutors, from other agencies that interact with the criminal justice system that help us figure out, so you know, where, where are the problems that are uh, occurring? Where are the biggest racial disparities? And how do we start to address those? Um, we'll, we'll also be looking at winning legal cases uh, that relate to racial profiling, prisoner rights, and other practices that criminalize poverty, that criminalize um, uh, other situations that uh, make people vulnerable uh, to the criminal justice system. And, uh, and then finally, I just want to say uh, we are also doing this campaign in a moment where there's a lot of energy for racial justice work in this state uh, that is being led by people of color like some of the students who will be awarded tonight. And so we also see our role is you know, taking the issue of systemic racism seriously, uh, but also wanting to follow the lead and help back uh, movements that are led by people of color here in our state. Uh, Ashley, is there anything else you wanted to add just about next steps, things you're excited about? I'm excited about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want to say it's a shame that the ACLU came out first to notify the public about uh, the prisoners being moved to Mississippi. So you can thank Duff for that. Um, because being a directly impacted person, I talk to people and I talk to families and I talk to incarcerated people. And so we get information that way that DOC doesn't want released right off or doesn't want people to necessarily know. Um, and if you pay attention to the media, I think there was another piece of media that, that came out that said 917 prisoners are violent. Um, they did this little bubble graft in Vermont Digger about you know, how the prison makeup and why people are there. And I think me and Jay sort of did a good job responding to that, asking for the data. Because since 2015, the DOC hasn't given us any accurate 
you know, collected data. So um, really working on, on uh, looking at that, looking at bail reform again, trying to, to work on that because it's about three to 400 Vermonters are held daily for lack of bail. The prison population out of state is 250. So these numbers seem to match up if you look at the reform measures and if you look at smart justice, talking about bail reform, prosecutory accountability, you know, the answers to that survey are gonna be a tool we use for accountability. You know, elected officials, we're gonna be looking for you to, to hold up to those sort of things that you commented on in the survey and the reform measures that you claim to support Sentencing and parole reform, you know, ending the war on drugs, and definitely the racial justice because that's the systemic <coughs> racial justice is where mass incarceration began and started from and continues to today. So, all right. So we want to make a little time for questions, um, but before we do that, we also just wanted to acknowledge that um, over the past year we have had the support of a number of partner groups that have helped uh, make our smart justice work possible, for Marches for Criminal Justice Reform, uh, Black Lives Matter Greater Burlington, the Rutland Area, NAACP, and the Wyndham County, NAACP, uh, Justice for All, uh, the Women's March will actually be uh, out tomorrow in Burlington with the Women's March uh, talking about smart justice, rights and democracy, and then the Roots Social Justice Center in Brattleboro. So, we really do see this as a coalition effort and, uh, and want to continue building uh, these community partnerships as we go. So with that, I think uh, we have a few minutes and Duff, you can cut us off anytime. We have plenty of time. All right, uh, but does anyone have any, any questions? Uh, we'll start here since you had a question, a hand up earlier. Um, I just was curious, you mentioned that that's, um, the attorney form yeah. Uh, Could you repeat the question, please? Sure, absolutely. So, um, so the question was uh, about the states of attorney forum that we that we held and uh, whether that was still available to watch, uh, which it is. I think you can find it uh, either through the Vermont Law School um, website. And Kate, is it on our website as well? Somewhere. It is on our Facebook page. Our Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, but it is still available. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, the poll that said 68% of Vermonters think that we should not be sitting in jail in the state. I'm just wondering, was this, this was an ACLU poll, and was it a poll of your members, or? Yeah. Uh, so it was a, a, basically we contracted with a company that does polling, so it was a totally independently done poll with uh, a random, a random sample. sampling of Vermonters, and I think it was about 5,000 people that were surveyed. Uh, let's take the question over here in the back. We were talking about prosecutors, but I'm wondering if uh, the judges, like the sentencing judges, are also incentivized to make That's a good question. What would you say about that? <laughs> so, historically here in Vermont, like I'll, I'll use my own sentence for example. So, uh, they wanted to give me two to six years to serve. Uh, luckily in my case, the judge sort of said that seems really extreme. But the judges historically will go on the recommendation. So 97% of cases, and that includes 97% of cases in Vermont, are done by plea agreement. So that is all work done before the judge ever gets involved. So that's agreements between, you know, the attorneys work back and forth. Um, but most of the time it's really guided by the prosecutors. Um, so at that point, once there's a plea agreement, it goes back in front of the judge and the judge just basically says, do you agree, do you agree? And, and signs it to really give you a simplified you know, version of that process. So unless you go to trial, the judge doesn't really deter from sort of what's what's been agreed upon between the parties of attorneys. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Sort of. I mean, yes, it does. Basically, it comes to if we can educate the judges or just like reverse it to make the judges think about it, as in the your case where it's like that seems to exclude. If we can just get them to do it that way, maybe that could do something too? Well, 
the complicated piece uh, with judges are that they, they're neutral parties. So A, um, in order to do any sort of training with them, that sort of alters sort of where they stand. But I think the real key is, and because it's more widespread and because there are so many plea agreements that judges aren't involved in until they're already sort of agreed upon, is really for state's attorneys in this state to commit to reform measures, to commit to, you know, um, changing the way that they sentence people, what they sentence people to, and what they're even trying. You know, I mean, what really getting at the heart of the issue. Yeah, and I would just add to that, I think, you know, one of the misperceptions that I think average people have about the criminal justice system is because, you know, courtroom dramas and things that we see, you know, show these really long cases, right, where it's like a passionate prosecutor and a really passionate defense attorney and the trial, you know, goes on for a long time, but it's, you know, most people who enter the system, it's just like people are being moved through so quickly that it's not like every judge or defense attorney who are, is going to be able to give a lot of sort of due consideration to every single defendant. So I, I think that's also, um, you know, part of what we're dealing with is just like the number of people flowing through the system means that there's just multiple opportunities for people to not, not really uh, be treated very fairly or with a lot of consideration. Uh, let's see, let's take this hand and then we'll come back through here and around the back. So in line with that, I mean, the counterpoint to the prosecutors, the public defender often, and they're caught in the same bind of having way too big a caseload to spend any time trying to come up with a reasonable plea agreement or thing, right? They sort of sign off to, to whatever goes on to the plea, it seems. Uh, I wonder if there's anything within the program that uh, looks to help support or empower public defenders in some way I think that really speaks to looking at sort of, you know, bail reform and sentencing reform as a whole. Because in the sense that we're just locking less people up, right? Or, you know, we're changing some of the parameters about what people are getting, you know, even arrested for and sentenced for in the first place to even have to go through the court process. And you know, it is common that uh, public defenders, especially here, as you saw in the videos, you know, we know that just there's so many thousands and thousands of cases going through. You know, it, it's impossible. And you only like 3% of Vermonters can afford a private attorney. I mean, so that really talks to who's going to jail. Right? So, you know, it's really looking at how, why are people getting in, engaged with the system in general and who are they? And, and really getting some support because you know, luckily, you know, if they can divert to say, we'll use treatment court, for example, not that that's the perfect solution, but, you know, that takes some of the weight off, you know, public defenders and people trying to, to do their best, because there's not a lot of time. I spent six minutes with my public defender. And it wasn't, you know, and they, you don't have a lot of access to them, and they don't have a ton of access to you, so. Uh, as you said, it's a, it's a long game that you're playing. What what efforts uh, can you engage in to enlist a future crop of prosecutors mm -hmm. for election beginning now so that they you, you can have the slate for you to engage in? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Yeah, if you didn't hear it, uh, the question was, uh, what could we be doing now to uh, engage uh, a sort of future group or future crop of prosecutors who are reform-minded, who are interested in being in that office uh, in a way that, that really helps uh, us work towards that reduction of the number of people in prison? And, and I think that's part of why we wanted to take the opportunity this year to do a lot of public education around this election because it does um, it, it does raise the profile of sort of the importance of that that particular role in a way that, that we hope engages more people who are attorneys and thinking about running in the future. Um, I mean, the state's attorney election, typically candidates are not really asked to be at forums, to fill out surveys. It's not written about in the press very much. So even just kind of bring more visibility to it, we think will help encourage people to run who 
maybe good people to have in that office. And I know some of our staff attorneys have also suggested um, doing some work over the next few years to um, talk to the Bar Association, to talk to um, law students and, and other people who uh, you know, are getting trained as attorneys to, um, to also have them think about this as a, a possible way that they could be involved in addressing mass incarceration. Uh, I know there's a hand here, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, I was a former judge in one of your courts and several of your courts. Uh, Do I need the mic since you're close enough? My question is about uh, judicial education. It seems to me that the key to helping you uh, find the end solution to your uh, initiatives is through education of judges. Mm -hmm. Judges get education every year, but you have it's limited because the time is limited. Uh, but you can get to uh, that uh, program, that educational program for judges through the Supreme Court because they're the ones in charge of all their education. So I would recommend that you do that because without the judges being aware of everything that you're aware of, it's gonna be a harder job to get prosecutors to move in your direction. Yeah, thanks for saying that. And I think with, you know, with any of these things, there are multiple angles and multiple ways we could go about it. And, and so I think that's one that, that we can continue to explore, I think. Um, I think part of it though, and, and I think part of the reason why we have wanted to be so public with this campaign is it's not just, it is about these people in individual positions making decisions, but it's also what, what is our culture of support and, and what are the positions that we have to have some buy-in from um, you know, in the general public in order to be successful. And I, I think part of what I mean by that is just a lot of people, um, whether they're state's attorneys or judges or sheriffs, um, can really build a career off of that message of, I'm gonna be tough on crime. I'm gonna lock the bad people away. And we're the ones electing those people. So we really have to do the work with our friends and our neighbors um, to educate people around us to say, you know, it's, it, it sounds good, you know, and, and none of us wanna be put in the way of, of harm. Um, but at the same time, uh, we really have to think about who it is that we're putting away, and if that is actually making us safer. And I think there's a lot, uh, a lot of studies and, and things that show that sending people to prison, you know, is, is not necessarily a remedy to uh, the harm that they've caused. Most people are going to come back to their communities, and so we want to think about what kind of shape are people coming back into their communities in. And uh, and we think that people are much better served by getting addiction treatment by um, having other kinds of access to social service, ser social services, education, other things that um, support people to, to, to shift or, or change the circumstances that may have led to whatever crime they committed in the back there. Thanks. So I've been concerned for many years about the prosecutorial misconduct, use of confidential informants, this you know, charging high and pleading down the middle, and all this stuff, and it would be great to see if there is someone uh, out there who would be charged uh, either in the administrative process or the re not the, uh, re upping process at the legislative level with some of this misconduct to, to make that not an example, but to show that they're subject to that uh, recall. Um, but I think I want to, I just want to urge you to take a uh, food chain approach to what you're doing. And you've made several great steps. But remember that the deputies and the assistants in these offices are the next state's attorneys. And some of these state's attorneys are also the next US attorneys. And they're all the future judges. And I think if they're led to believe that these surveys and these answers and this interaction is going to be made to be used for voter education as they work their way up this food chain, mm -hmm. they're going to feel it and see it. Sad that we have to go to that level to get the impact as voters, but it is an obscure office for most voters. And, uh, I think you guys are running the right track, but the food chain approach is, is the way to go. The judges can't answer these things, I assume. They're sort of insulated once they're in office, but, but we're, we're looking at the crop. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 
Um, I definitely agree with the, the food chain approach, and I think that that's sort of where we're starting. So it, as this being our first year of Smart Justice, I think that you know, we were seeing how officials were gonna react to us, but also how our members, you guys, and how the public was gonna react because this is a new approach for Vermont. So for example, with the survey, a lot of what, you know, some of what we got was that's not the Vermont way, but it is, right? Like Vermonters are smart, caring, <coughs> look at all you guys, like you care about what's going on and you care about doing right by your community and by the people that you love. And so I think that the food chain approach is definitely a right approach, but it's also gonna be, we need to change the mindset, right? We need to change the culture. You are not any safer because I went to prison. I know people who were charged with violent crimes, who spent years and years out of state. You are not safer because they went through that. You're safer because they're not violent people and it was a situation that happened, but that was never looked at. You know, the reality is, is no one in this room is safer solely because someone went to prison because statistically, prison makes people worse. And in Vermont, <laughs> I'm clapping, but I'm holding the mic. <laughs> no, but, but that's the reality, right? And, and, you know, we see a lot about, you know, the budgets and, and taxes, and we want to talk about that stuff. But a lot of these measures and a lot of the things that we want to look at don't take more money. It's just a reappropriation of money that's being used to lock people up and throw away the key. And then they're getting out and you're not any safer. So would you rather someone say, go to jail for a year, but get treatment and help and get better? Or would you rather send them away for 10 years and come out after that experience with no support? and no treatment and no help and move in next to your child or move in next to your sister or move in next to your best friend. That's the reality. So we need a mindset and a culture shift from tough on crime. So I see there's a lot more hands and I'm, Jeff, I'm gonna keep looking to you for a time check. Okay, great. So like here and here and we'll try to catch a few more. Just a quick question related to this. Vermont has the fifth highest child removal rate from families in the country, and I've been part of a panel that talks about that. And one of the issues that's consistently um, brought up about this is the weakness and underfunding of the Defender General system. I've had two governors and many legislators say to me it's politically not popular to fund the Defender General system, even though it's constitutionally appropriate. One judge on the panel said, I routinely get mothers coming in with, um, you know, about to lose their child, and the defender who's been appointed or the appointed attorney has not read the case. And as the judge, I have read the case. And to, to me, this is somewhat related to the over-incarceration piece. I just would welcome your thoughts. So I have five children, uh, two of which I have custody of. So I have three children that, well, four of my children were removed from my custody by DCF through a chins hearing because of my involvement with drugs. And keep in mind, I had no business having my children while I was getting high. And I admit fully to that, and I'm fully accountable for that. Um, but you, you are correct. And it's directly related to, then again, my incarceration you know, with, with addiction. And today my children are all happy and healthy and well adjusted and they, I see them all and they all know I'm their mom and I spend lots of time with all of them. But the reality is, is, is the collateral damage, so we talked about those collateral consequences when you incarcerate mothers, okay? You're incarcerating the whole family. So we've got children going into prisons to visit their mommies, okay? We've got children who then develop things like PTSD, social anxiety, depression, then what, where do they go? Well, they go back to school, right? And then the schools are trying to deal with how do we support these kids that are going through this? And there are more effective tools across the board. Even if you think that I committed my crimes and I deserved what I got, which some people think, and that's fine. Did my children? Did my children deserve to be incarcerated as well? Did they deserve the, the collateral consequences that they still deal with? So you're right, we do need to look at that, and we do need to look at the whole picture, not just the one person that's committing the crime, but the person that they're, you know, moms and dads, they're the center of these kids' worlds. Uh, 
I'm not sure whether I'm just not completely getting what people are saying, but to me it seems like it's not just people, it's also laws and the legislature. And you mentioned that you've been talking to the legislature, but you didn't, I didn't hear you talking too much about what that conversation has involved. If somebody could tell me more about that piece of it, because as just sort of a well-meaning, what can I do? I think I can do more bugging my legislator than I can talking to a judge or something. Yeah, absolutely, and I do think that that is one way that we want people to engage going forward is to kind of pay attention to uh, what is going through the legislature that we can either be supporting or opposing. Um, our policy director, Chloe, is currently <laughs> working on the plan for this coming session, but, but just to give some examples of the, the types of, of policy things and legislative things that uh, we're looking at at the moment, um, I mentioned data collection, which again isn't a really sexy thing to talk about, um, but we think it's a really key part of getting the information that we need um, to create some of the, the plans or proposals for reducing the number of people in prison as, as well as addressing uh, racial disparities in different parts of the system. Uh, we're also looking at things like, um, for instance, uh, lowering the felony threshold for things like theft. So currently you can get it, uh, or sorry, raising, raising is what I guess. Yeah, yeah. So currently, you know, um, if, if you steal something uh, that is worth more than $900, that's a felony. And so that, that charge carries a lot more weight, a lot more of the collateral consequences. Even just bumping that threshold up a little bit means that um, you end up with, with more people with misdemeanors and fewer people with felonies, which impact sentencing and parole and other consequences coming out uh, of any kind of conviction. So, um, so that kind of thing. Uh, we're also looking at what kind of reforms we can make to our parole and sentencing laws because I think part of the issue is not just about um, uh, sort of people who are getting charged with crimes, but but also uh, how long are we sending those people away for? And then as they're working on transitioning out, what are the barriers that we set up that, um, that you know, cause people to end up back in prison, maybe just for a, a technical violation of some kind on their, while they're on parole. So they missed a meeting with their parole officer um, or other kinds of situations like that where they haven't actually committed a new crime, but they can be, be sent back to prison um, because of those violations. So we're looking at, at what, you know, what those policies are and how we can start to do uh, some of those reforms, uh, and then also looking at uh, other things that Duff wants to jump in on this one. Yeah, I just want to add, but it's a great point. I mean, we are definitely doing this very much as a public education campaign because that is so necessary for all of the reasons that Nico and Ashley have been talking about, but there's a huge policy component to it. You're absolutely right. And I mean, I, I just, really quickly, a couple things. I mean, first, the legislature has been doing a lot of great criminal justice reform work over the past several years. Vermont's prison population is in decline. Um, and a lot of what we're saying is, that's great, let's keep doing that, let's do more of that, and let's keep the urgency up. Um, we've gone to the legislature with a list of bills, some of which have been introduced by individual legislators, some of which um, increasingly are gonna be introduced by us, um, uh, as Nico said, I mean, some of those examples, bail reform was, was up in the last legislature and Chloe worked very um, hard on bail reform. We would like to see bail reform go much further. There's a sentencing commission, um, there are parole issues, there's that. So there's a whole host of things. There's no one thing, there's no magic bullet that's suddenly going to you know, turn the ship around um, and, re and cut the prison population in half. Uh, overnight, but it's there is a, a there are many of options, and um, you know the ACLU nationally is rolling out a 50-state blueprint for individualized to each state um, to to sort of offer up that menu of options for well, if you cut these crimes, the sentences for these crimes by 50 percent, that will have this impact. If you approach bail reform in this way, it will have this impact. And so we're increasingly looking, armed with data, eventually. Uh, to, to have a, a more sophisticated uh, policy uh, analysis and recommendations. But, you know, again, I, I think a lot of the, the public education uh, and, and communications work that we're doing is really laying the groundwork so that people are, you know, hopefully more receptive to uh, those proposals 
and understand that the public wants that too. The polling shows the public is not stuck in the tough on crime era, and our legislators need to get out of that mindset as well. So lots of questions. I think I'm gonna take one more uh, from this side of the room since we haven't come back this way. And then I think we may have to wrap it up. But Ashley and I will be around at the end of the, the presentation today if people wanna to talk to us more. Um, so I am a state rep and am involved with some of the bills that um, were referred to. But I'm wondering about a couple of other approaches. One is getting a court watch program going which could help with the educational effort. I'm also <coughs> wondering about legislation to specifically address limiting how much discretion prosecutors have out of the gate rather than just leave it up to them. Um, and taking also the data, which I think financially will make a financial case in addition to other things. So, the state is big on results-based accountability, and I think we need to look at recidivism rates. How many people that are going back to prison for furlough violations that have absolutely no check and balance is up to the individual um, corrections worker? People sitting in prison because they don't have houses. How much? So if we had dollar signs, pictures with dollar signs showing how much taxpayers are paying, or things that are making matters worse, not better. I think those approaches could help um, make another dent in the curve. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think we need all of those things. Um, you know, you mentioned the Court Watch program, which uh, other, I know there are states and cities that do that. And for people that aren't familiar with that, that, that would be like volunteers with the ACLU kind of forming a team to go uh, actually watch court proceedings and take notes on what they're seeing happen within those proceedings uh, as a different kind of data, I think, to say, are prosecutors actually being consistent with what they're saying publicly, their practices are with what's happening uh, when they're actually in the courtroom. Um, so so I, we've actually had that on our list as a, an area to explore. I don't know that we'll do it uh, next year, but I, I do think that, um, you know, those kind of innovations that involve community members in uh, creating that oversight and accountability, I think are really interesting. Uh, and then I think a bunch of the other things that, that you mentioned um, are really important as well. Um, so I'm gonna give Ashley the last word uh, in case you wanna comment on anything else and then we'll wrap it up. Um, yeah, in states, there is a state that's pioneered, so I believe it's New York, data prosecutorial uh, committee, oversight committee, through legislation. So, I mean, it's it's starting. It's Vermont needs to, we need to get on that train. Because, right, there's a lot of things that once brought out into the light are going to make effective change. And the dollar signs, like you were talking about, you know, furlough, it does depend. If your probation officer is having a bad day, and let's say you get a dirty UA, you go to prison, but tomorrow he's having a great day because his eggs were perfect, mm -hmm. the next person gets a dirty way but doesn't go back to jail. There is no rhyme or reason there. So we are incarcerating people, reincarcerating people, which has nothing to do with committing a new crime. <laughs> so that's a very important place that I think we've talked a lot about looking at and, and wanting to get some. And on transitional housing, that's something else we want to take a look at. In November, we'll be doing an online forum on transitional housing and what approvable housing means. Talking about the, the people that are you know being housed right now for lack of residence. So that'll be in November. So we are we are definitely looking at all these areas that everyone has brought up. We're definitely we have a big map and, and we're gonna touch upon all of them I think in one way or another. <laughs> and all the work that is going to be Okay. Um, that was 
great. And if I, I know there were some more questions, so please take the opportunity to ask those uh, of Nico, Ashley, myself, uh, other staff. Um, and you can do that now during the break. I know it is hard to come back from a break, um, but we have a really exciting and engaging and informative second half of our meeting, uh, and I can't wait to get started, so, so let's do it. Um, would you all please join me in welcoming Julie Kalish, ACLU Vermont Board President, who is going to deliver the President's Report uh, right now. Julie. Look, it's up my head. <laughs> All right, is that, is that okay? Yeah. All right. Um, I have a feeling that I am not going to be the engaging, exciting part of the second half, but I might be the informative part of the second half of the program. I also have reached the point where I can no longer see and have to do this. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Now I can't see you. Maybe, maybe that's good. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much for coming today. And um, it's always, every year when I come here, it's so nice to see all of the familiar faces and people who come out and make the long trip every single year. Um, I have hair that caught, caught my glasses. Um, and there are also, I see, a lot of new faces, which is so exciting. It's really great. And I want to welcome all of the new people to this is your first annual meeting. Um, I hope that you find in this community the kind of meaning and um, sense of community, community that I know that I have found in my years of affiliation with the organization. Um, and in fact, we have a couple of brand new, like brand new, like three months old, and there was a, uh, there was a very young, sweet Black Lives Matter activist who I saw over here who's doing excellent work already, I can tell. Um, so that's really exciting too, and it's so exciting to see all of the young students who are, who are here who are being honored, and I can't tell you how excited I am about that. Um, but so this is my first time standing up here. I have to talk to you before, those of you who have been here in the past, but never before doing the President's Report. And I really, um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about, um, I really wish I had something more hopeful and inspiring to say. Um, but for as excited as I am by the growth that we've seen in this affiliate and its amazing staff and really, I am awed by the work and the, just the sheer talent of the people that we have right now um, working with us at the ACLU of Vermont. It's, it, we are poised to enter like such, we already have such an exciting period of work and growth here at the organization. And that's amazing. Um, but we are also at this moment poised to enter a period of legal change. Um, a period of legal change, the likes of which I never really thought possible in my lifetime. Um, obviously, I'm referring here to the possibility of Brett Kavanaugh taking Justice Kennedy's open seat on the Supreme Court. And um, I have to tell you, it's been one hell of a week to try to write this. <laughs> I have revised this and rewritten this, I think, twice a day for the past week. And I probably could have done it again this morning. I it just, but I'm, I gave up. Um, so, so whether it's Brett Kavanaugh <laughs> or whether it is another jurist chosen from Trump's list of 25 that, um, let's be honest, was generated, everybody knows was generated by the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society um, to achieve a certain set of purposes, whether it's him or whether it's another person from that list. Um, it's really hard to understate the implications of Justice Kennedy's retirement on what the future of civil rights and civil, li civil liberties is gonna look like. Um, and the extent to which we will come to understand those rights as being protected by the Constitution. Um, and that is really hard to understate. 
clearly um, the right that everybody has been talking about, obviously, is abortion. Um, and ever since the finding of the abortion right in Roe v. Wade, there's been a concerted effort to overturn that decision by groups of very highly dedicated people. And that was a long path, um, but there was an unmistakable process going on. What is your stance on Roe v. Wade uh, became a very clear political litmus test for anybody who was trying to get near the Senate or near the Oval Office, and whether the expected answer was supposed to be pro or whether it was supposed to be con. The whole point of that question was, what are you going to do when it comes time to appoint the next Supreme Court justice? And indeed, over time, um, changes to the bench in the years since 1973 have, in fact, unmistakably altered and restricted the abortion right. Justice Kennedy himself actually authored one of those decisions. Um, it was Gonzales v. Carhart, and it allowed the government to ban what had come to be known as partial birth abortion. I don't know how many of you were paying attention to that. But since his appointment, despite that, Justice Kennedy has also been the last remaining Republican appointee to hold fast to what Planned Parenthood versus Casey Court um, called the central holding of Roe, which is basically that the Constitution does, in fact, protect a woman's fundamental right to make the decision whether or not to end a pregnancy. Um, but now, obviously, with Justice Kennedy gone, all of that is poised to change. Whether it's going to happen through an outright overruling of Roe, or whether it happens through a functional equivalent by gutting the undue burden test, if Kavanaugh or another person from the list fills Justice Kennedy's seat, each state is going to be deciding for itself, with essentially no floor, whether to protect, whether to inhibit, whether even possibly to completely ban women's access to abortion. And it's going to be basically sort of the situation we had before the Roe v. Wade decision, with each state being able to make its choice. There are other changes, other changes we should also expect to see with Justice Kennedy's retirement. Um, we should also anticipate an end to race-conscious affirmative action and race-conscious programs and processes of many different types. Those who have been paying attention to this um, know that there's been an onslaught of challenges to state legislation that attempts to address racial disparities in education. Uh, many of those challenges have actually reached the Supreme Court over the past decade. And those who have been following those cases, um, they also know that in each one of the cases that has upheld the use of race as a consideration, Justice Kennedy was the swing vote. Um, so as with abortion, opponents of race-conscious affirmative action have been preparing for this precise moment. Um, in fact, Edward Blum, I don't know if those of you who follow his work, um, Edward Blum, he's the legal activist who was behind Shelby County versus Holder. He was behind um, Fisher versus University of Texas. Uh, he has been working to ensure that there are cases in the pipeline mm -hmm. that are coming up and ready for Supreme Court review. The most prominent of, of which, I don't know how many have been reading about this, but the challenge um, to Harvard's admissions policies. Um, and in fact, you probably read in the paper that the Sessions Justice, Justice Department just recently weighed in on that case um, and not surprisingly did so against Harvard. Uh, given these opportunities, I, I have to say that I I think we should expect that within the next four to five years, uh, it's very likely that the court will have officially adopted Justice Thomas's position that what equal protection under the 14th Amendment means is absolute color blindness. And there's going to be little, unlike in the abortion context, there's going to be little that Congress or the states can do on their own um, when it comes to that change. We will, I told you this is going to be a downer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll probably see other erosions in rights that affect racial minorities. Um, it's likely that disparate impact claims under, the, under civil rights laws, laws such as the, as the Fair Housing Act, are no longer going to be the viable kinds of claims that they used to be. Um, disparate because, precisely because disparate impact claims require government to be aware of race when they're making their decisions, which is going to offend that approach of equal protection meaning color blindness. Um, 
without these sorts of tools, we'll see a substantial weakening of civil rights era legislation. Um, and sort of just as I referred to Shelby County versus Holder, just as uh, Shelby County took away Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act, when you take away um, a key sort of enforcement tool, it winds up weakening the, the, the piece of legislation. Um, we're likely to see incredible levels of deference to states, to law enforcement, to the, and to the federal government when it comes respectively to restrictions on voting rights, um, to protections for criminal defendants, um, when it comes to immigration and national security. All of these are areas that have clear racial implications. Um, advancement of rights for the LGBTQ community will likely stall. At, um, personally, personally, I think marriage, the marriage decision itself is safe. Um, despite his passionate dissent, I don't think Justice Roberts will have a taste for overruling Obergefell so quickly. Um, I think he's, he's a justice who's very concerned about court legitimacy, and I just don't think he would have a taste for that. But there are a number of questions that are already in the pipeline that directly affect the, um, the rights and, the dig and dignity of LGBTQ individuals. Um, these include questions about the extent of sex discrimination protections under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, questions about First Amendment religious liberty rights to refuse service. Um, that was an issue, that was the Masterpiece Cake Shop uh, mm -hmm issue, but the court sort of very prominently left that question undecided. So it's still sort of hovering out there. There are lots of others. Um, I, I don't think we can expect that the arc of the moral universe is going to be bending towards justice on these questions anytime soon, um, at least not at the federal level. Um, so. Um, What do we do? <laughs> so what do we do? Um, and I, this, I think, I feel like this is where I'm going to kind of jump on the bandwagon with um, Nico and Ashley and, and what they were saying and talking about. Um, first, we vote. We vote um, not only this November, but at every single election, every single election matters. Um, every elected position matters. Um, <laughs> We heard about the work that um, Smart Justice is doing um, with the state's attorney's offices and all the public education that, that they're doing. Uh, there are so many offices, roles, that I don't think people understand the, the extent of their impact. And we need to make sure that people do, because it matters. Um, so we can also, we're all sitting here in this room, yay, uh, we can double down on our support of the ACLU of Vermont. <laughs> Buy some swag. Um, so really, um, these folks, Andrea, Ashley, Barbara, Chloe, Jay, Kate, Leah, Nico, Stephanie, um, they are all, they're working so hard every day all across the state. Um, our reach is so huge now, it's so exciting um, to make sure that the rights of Vermonters can survive and can flourish and, and duff. <laughs> duff. <laughs> duff, I truly can't say enough about you. Um, and uh, his leadership, his vision, um, the energy and passion that he has brought to his role as the ex executive director. I, it's, just, it's just amazing. The transformations that have taken place over these past two years. Um, and thank you, Donald Trump. <laughs> for that too. We have to give credit where credit is due. We would not have been able to hire all the wonderful staff <laughs> without that little Trump bump. Um, support the Vermont ACLU. Um, ooh, they, I think we had people doing the Trump bump back. No, we were saying big bump. Oh, big bump. Big bump. Big bump. I thought it was like a move. It wasn't a move. Okay. Um, Really, the kinds of changes that we've we've seen taking place, I I never would have thought possible, um, both for the good and for the bad, 
and for the in-between. Um, but as far as this organization goes, definitely for the good. Um, so however you're able to and however you choose to, please help support um, the work that these folks are doing. And that can be through buying swag, through donations, through community involvement, participation in events, uh, responses to our can alerts, um, or just talking up our issues and talking us up with friends and neighbors your support really helps. It really does. Um, similarly, support our coalition partners. Um, you saw them. We have so many exciting new co coalition partners across the state. We saw Big List of them, Migrant Justice, Justice for All, Black Lives Matter, the Vermont Women's March, NAACP. There's so many people and groups doing important work. And they're doing that kind of work at every single level, at the community level, at the state level, at the national level. And it's more important than ever for all of us to play a role. Um, it's more important than ever for us to all actually, in doing so, believe in our own agency, in our own ability to make change, that our individual actions matter. Um, because, and it, sort of Nico was alluding to this earlier, like, let's be clear, there's never been any kind of change, neither political nor legal, um, that hasn't first had its path cleared and groomed by individuals. Um, by people banding together and demanding change so powerfully and with such a unified voice that it becomes morally unacceptable to act otherwise. No one actually, I'm so excited to be here in the room with them, no one actually illustrates this better than the students who are sitting in this room with us. You students, the demanding change in your schools, the students, um, if we look more nationally, the students of Parkland, Florida, demanding change from nation's lawmakers when it comes to guns, you're cut from the same cloth. You know, you are aware of the strength of your voice. You know that, well, that's just the way it is. Or you're just kids. That these aren't actually reasons. These aren't reasons to accept the status quo. You know that actually, because it's the right thing to do, is actually the best reason there is for doing anything. Through your acts, you've actually shown us the path forward. It's your questioning, your insistence on calling out injustice when you see it, that actually holds the seeds of change. You're our conscience. And you can actually be, you're, for all of us, you can be our moral compass if we let you. <laughs> Um, and that's actually, you know, I, I teach, and it's because of you, it's because of my students, um, that I actually, there have been some dark moments <laughs> over the past couple of years, and it's you who are the ones who make me sort of get up every day feeling hopeful still. Um, so one of, this is one of my very favorite quotes, it's a Bobby Kennedy quote, and um, I'm sure there are people who already know what it is. Bobby Kennedy said, few will have the greatness to bend history itself. But each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And it's from num numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a person, he said man, but I'm ingesting. <laughs> each time a person stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, they send forth tiny, a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. It is, it's one of my favorite quotes because oftentimes we feel like we're acting alone and that what we do really has no impact. But none of us ever really knows how far the ripples will extend from any one of our acts but we need somehow to believe that they will. So thank you. Thank you for everything that you do, that you do to send out a ripple of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Julie.
So, as happens every year, I've left myself very little time to talk. Uh, every year I say I'm not going to do that, and every year I do. So I'm going to talk quickly, um, and I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that, that Julie um, sounded, um, because here we are about a month and a half out from an election with pretty enormous implications for not just Vermont, but obviously for the whole country. Um, uh, we have a Supreme Court. Trump is about to get his Supreme Court pick. Um, he's all, he has been uh, filling the lower courts with uh, extremists for some time and will continue to do that. Um, the, same, uh, the same has been happening at the state and local level over many years. Um, doing possibly as much or more damage to American civil rights and civil liberties than uh, the Trump administration has even managed to do over the past 19 months and two days, not that I'm counting. <laughs> um, I mean, we have obviously, I don't have to tell you, we've witnessed an unprecedented and relentless assault on our laws, on our values, on uh, the rule of law, uh, to the point that uh, doesn't seem to be an exaggeration to say that the, the fate of our democracy is very much in doubt. Um, and so, you know, again, sounding on the gloomy themes of, of, of Julie's uh, portion, the, the gloomy portions of Julie's report. And so, I mean, as she said, what, what do we do about that? Um, and, you know, one answer has always been the ACLU's answer is we fight like hell, Ooh. right? Yeah. If, if we care about these things, we have to fight like hell, and that's what we do. Uh, that's exactly what the ACLU, our supporters, our friends, our allies across the country have been doing. Um, you know, the ACLU, as you know, has been backed by a growing membership. Uh, the support of our members nationwide has allowed us to add new staff, launch ambitious campaigns, and initiate upwards of 200 legal actions to counter the Trump administration's agenda. Um, you know, one, just on immigrant rights alone, uh, ACLU lawsuits have stopped the monstrous policy of separating young families at the border. We've sued over Jeff Sessions' blanket denial of asylum to victims of domestic violence and gang violence. And we filed multiple challenges to the administration's ever-expanding immigration detention system. And that's just a small sample of what we have done and, and with more certain to come from both sides in that fight. Um, in Vermont over the past year, we have also fought hard uh, for an alternative vision to what we're seeing at the federal level. Uh, as the ACLU has done nationally, we've continued to stand with Vermont's immigrant communities, including the migrant justice activists who've been targeted for politically motivated retaliatory arrests and detention. We filed multiple FOIA lawsuits related to ICE and Border Patrol activities statewide that we still don't know the extent of or the details of, but we're going to find out. Um, and we're going to keep pushing local and state policymakers to do more to ensure that immigrant rights are respected and that immigrant communities are safe. As we had been doing, we have continued to fight for racial justice in Vermont, where people of color are still dis disproportionately disciplined in our schools, stopped and searched by police, and incarcerated in our prisons. We're working with community partners to pass legislation establishing ethnic study standards for all of our public schools so that all students' voices, histories, and experiences are respected and are included. We will be insisting that Vermont's new uh, racial equity panel uh, newly formed takes action to dismantle institutionalized racism in this state. Of our two racial profiling lawsuits now pending against Vermont law enforcement, one is at the Vermont Supreme Court awaiting decision. The other is now moving forward despite the efforts of the city of Bennington um, to, to have it thrown out um, both times unsuccessfully. Uh, we have continued to stand with Vermont's homeless community to oppose the further criminalization of poverty in this state. Again, working with community partners, we have helped defeat efforts to criminalize low-level public order uh, offenses in Burlington, and we've pushed for an end to local ordinances that criminalize panhandling in multiple Vermont cities and towns, including right here in Montpelier. 
We settled a lawsuit with Burlington for its role in evicting so-called nuisance tenants, and we immediately filed another lawsuit against Burlington, this time challenging the city's eviction of homeless encampments and its practice of confiscating, without due process, in some cases, the only earthly possessions of some of our most destitute neighbors. <laughs> All practices that blatantly violate our, our laws and offend our values. So we are fighting like hell. And for the ACLU in Vermont and elsewhere, that has traditionally meant filing a lot of lawsuits. And we are going to keep doing that. But clearly, lawsuits alone are not enough. Okay. Um, if there was any doubt of that, just look to the Supreme Court's willingness this past term to abrogate its responsibility for safeguarding fundamental, fundamental uh, uh, principles and premises of our democracy in upholding the Trump administration's Muslim ban. And the fact is, while the courts remain critical to the defense of civil rights, we cannot rely on them alone. Uh, and furthermore, we must recognize that the election of Donald Trump is but a symptom of a much larger problem in our democracy that if not fundamentally corrected is going to resurface again and again and again. Yes, it can get worse. And the courts aren't going to do that work by themselves. They can't do that work by themselves. Um, and so recognizing that fact, the ACLU has for several years now been working to develop and incorporate new strategies more strategies to safeguard our rights and advance justice and equality at the local, state, and federal levels. Much of the work I just described in Vermont over the past year alone involved not just litigation, but also policy advocacy, community organizing, strategic communications, and public education. And with the new staff that we've been able to bring on, we are leveraging these new strategies to involve more ACLU members, supporters, students, and voters in the political process, to get political, okay? You may have heard that the ACLU is moving towards a more political, becoming a more political organization, and that, that change is underway here in Vermont as well. Uh, you've just heard about our first initial foray into this, this stage, our first steps into becoming more politically active. Um, although we remain uh, nonpartisan and will continue to refrain from endorsing or opposing candidates for office, um, but, uh, you know, the, our first step forward in this direction is obviously the Smart Justice Campaign. Uh, this year, for the first time in our history, the ACLU of Vermont is employing political and electoral strategies to raise awareness, increase engagement, and mobilize Vermonters to hold public officials more accountable to the vision of Vermont that we all want to see realized. Uh, as Nico mentioned uh, previously, we conducted statewide polling. We found that two-thirds of Vermonters want Smart Justice reforms, and we're using those findings to show the candidates and to show all public officials that the public is behind them if they enact reform and the public has moved past the tough on crime era. Um, armed with the polling data, we conducted candidate surveys and published a voter guide, uh, again providing Vermont voters for the first time with information about the most powerful elected officials they've never heard of, their local state's attorneys. We sponsored candidate forums, ran paid ads, hosted webinars, gave presentations, all the things that Nico mentioned. And, and much, much more, all things that we have never done before. Um, and even though this, this specific campaign is only eight months old, we've already succeeded in making mass incarceration a campaign issue and establishing a strong reform frame in the public discourse and the political discourse, forcing even old school candidates to acknowledge that, yeah, Vermont does need to reduce its prison population. Um, that is a world away from where we were 20 years ago. Um, when the candidates would be falling all over themselves to proclaim who was tougher on crime than, than the rest. Um, that framing and that framework and that orientation is gonna be, is the groundwork that is gonna be absolutely critical to the ultimate success of this long-term campaign. And we're not gonna start with, uh, stop with Smart Justice. The campaign is only just beginning, it's gonna continue, but we're gonna build from the experience as we head into the next legislative session and beyond. Um, Last year, the legislature, our legislature concluded the first biennium of the Trump era. Uh, and while there are many examples of great leadership that the ACLU worked to support, including legislation to restore net neutrality, to address systemic racism in the state, to end sexual assault in the workplace, and to reduce our prison population, and the fact is we and our elected officials must do far more to meet the challenges that we face in this historical moment. 
Here in Vermont, we have both the opportunity and the responsibility to articulate a better, bolder vision and agenda and to counter the profound injustices that we're seeing at the national level. And to do that, it's going to be imperative that we engage more people in the political process. Again, more students, more activists, more voters to demand and win changes here in Vermont that can reverberate outside the state. Vermont has already shown that it can rise to the occasion and lead on these issues, but we need to be doing much more of that right now. Uh, the lessons we are learning through Smart Justice will allow us to build on the experience, to hold our elected leaders accountable, and spur them to take those bolder actions. And so, um, to conclude, I'm just going to repeat again that the ACLU must and will continue to fight in the courts. We're not going to stop doing that. ACL, ACLU litigation can be so powerful, and we, you know, we saw that uh, most recently in the, the lawsuit to stop uh, the separation of immigrant families at the border. Um, that's just one example of the power of our legal programs nationwide. Um, but the point is, if we're going to be effective and win the many battles we still have to fight, uh, the battles that Julie alluded to and so many more, we're, we're going to need to engage, educate, organize, and mobilize people like never before to do the difficult work of building power from the ground up and to support our grassroots partners who've been doing that work for a long time. And we're going to need your help. So we call on you, our members and supporters, to stand with the ACLU in this difficult but crucial task of building and sustaining movements for social change in this state and across the country. Uh, and we are confident that working together, we can advance an alternative, inclusive, and positive agenda. We can hold our government accountable, and we can win. Thank you. So, um, we're going to move right on into our awards presentation. And this year, it is my great privilege and great honor, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited, um, to, to be here to present the ACLU of Vermont's David W. Curtis Civil Liberties Award to the student organizations and their members who earlier this year succeeded in making their schools among the very first in the nation to raise the Black Lives Matter flag. So I don't think I have to tell you uh, why these actions were so powerful and so significant. Uh, institutionalized racism and white supremacy remain woven into the fabric of our society and our state, as they have been since before the founding of this country. Uh, but in recent years, we have seen an onslaught of racist rhetoric and actions at the highest levels of government, and you know what I'm talking about. Uh, continuing police violence against people of color and the continuation of new Jim Crow policies, not just in our criminal justice system, but at every level of our society, from schools to healthcare to housing and more. All of that applies in full to Vermont, same as everywhere else. And so it is in that context um, and in the face of uh, no doubt, uh, many doubts from the doubters and attacks from the haters and indifference from far too many white people in this state uh, who still remain indifferent or far too indifferent uh, in the face of massive inequality and injustice. It is in that context that these students took action and did something bold and beautiful and powerful. And so we salute them and we stand with them in the groups that they represent and with people of color across this state and across this country, and we say it again, that yes, black lives matter. Yeah. So we have with us here today representatives from several of these amazing groups to receive the award on their behalf. Um, not all of the groups were able to make it, it's a busy time of year, uh, but we're going to make sure that they do uh, receive them. Um, but I would like to ask the students who are here to, to come up.
still here. Um, so, the ACLU and its members are proud to present this award to the members of the Montpelier High School Racial Justice Alliance, the Burlington High School Social Justice Union, U32 High School's BLAM, Black, Latinos, Asians, and many more. <laughs> Brattleboro Area Middle School Aware, Brattleboro Union High School Aware, the Essex High School Diversity Club, and Youth for Change also of Brattleboro. So, um, again. <laughs> Not all the groups are here, but uh, those that are, Julie's going to help me present them. Uh, first, to Montpelier High School's Racial Justice Alliance, if you can just identify yourselves so Julie can present the award to you. And I'm going to read the award once they've been presented. <laughs> The American Civil Liberties Union of Vermont presents its 34th annual David W. Curtis Civil Liberties Award to these students and the organizations that they represent for courageously and with great integrity leading the movement to fly the Black Lives Matter flag over their schools, for lifting up the experiences of students of color in Vermont, affirming their importance and their truth, for advancing racial justice and equality, promoting dialogue and inspiring change in our communities, for confronting systemic racism and racist violence in all its forms in Vermont and nationwide, for raising their voices to demand a better of ourselves, uh, our state, and our country. With this award, we recognize their historic accomplishment and their continuing dedication to making our schools and our state places where all are safe and welcome and where every Vermonter can thrive. Awarded this 22nd day of September 2018 in Montpelier, Vermont. Please give a big hand to our award winner. Thing that is helping us 
uh, with um, promoting justice in society. So thank you. So that's why it took us over a year to even like get the pass from the school board to raise the flag. So it really took the community supporters who are willing to say, yes, this needs to happen right now to get the faculty and administration to change their ideas. <laughs>
that the ACLU should stand for the proposition that democracy begins at home. And it's not democracy if you don't get a real choice. Very much. It's about the process, not about the sure. people. No, I understand. I mean, I, I would just point out that, you know, our membership bylaws allow for either contested or uncontested elections. Over the 51 years the ACA Vermont's been doing it, there have been many contested and non-contested elections. Some years they're contested, some years they're not. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, the board has, has debated and discussed this policy recently. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, this year, last year we voted on changes to the bylaws where the votes absolutely mattered, um, I think. The year before that, there was a contested election. So it's there, just just to be clear, there's no policy against contested elections. Just practice, just practice. Mm -hmm. Not, not. I mean, as I say, the bylaws allow for allow for both, and sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. That's that's sort of where things stand. Um, but point well taken. <laughs> um, so before I close again, I, I, I do want to thank you all for your support. If you haven't yet, please consider making a donation with Barbara and Steph at the back table uh, to ensure that people of all ages across Vermont uh, experience the promise of justice and equality for all. In some ways, we are just getting started, and there is uh, still a lot of work to be done uh, in this state, as you all know. Um, so please continue supporting the ACLU. Please stay engaged. Please stay in touch. Thanks again for coming. Onwards.